So this is part two of the lecture on themes in art for art and experience. I wanted to say a little bit more about this painting Guernica by Pablo Picasso because I was rushing at the end of the last lecture. First let's notice a few things about it. He's getting into his cubism at this point. So in this way of looking at art, he's sort of looking at it from many different perspectives at once. You'll notice that it's black and white. And let's review, he is expressing his outrage that the Nazis um, practiced what they called saturation bombing of the town of Guernica, which is in northern Spain. So Picasso said that he painted this in black and white because it was just too ugly to have any color. And again, this is 28 feet long, okay, huge thing. And it was supposed to be created for the World's Fair in Paris in 1938. But it was so politically volatile that he couldn't show it. In fact, it had to be sneaked out of Europe and flown to New York, where it stayed until after the war. And now it's considered a real masterpiece. So now we're going to move on, and we're going to talk about art of the moment. Now, what that means is really art that depicts everyday life. This particular piece really is political art and art that depicts everyday life. And I wanted to show it because it's by uh, a very well-known artist, Norman Rockwell. But Norman Rockwell, who he's usually uh, known for painting nice Americana scenes and the, the covers to the Saturday Evening Post, for this one, he's protesting. He's protesting the um, oppression of people of color during the 1960s. And if you look closely, there's an, um, a derogatory slur, a racial slur written on the wall, and there's a little girl walking to school. She's um, uh, protected by federal agents, and somebody's throwing rotten tomatoes at her. I find this such a moving piece, and it's a body of Norman Rockwell's work that we don't usually see as much as we do see his, you know, kind of all Americana mom, dad, apple pie sort of images, because that's really what he could do, what he could sell politically. So this is both historic, it's telling a story, it's also um, just a moment in life, and it's an important political statement. So here we're going to talk about another aspect of art depicting everyday life that's really interesting. Going back to Egypt, so when the pharaohs died and they went into these elaborate tombs on into the afterlife, well, they would have to have everything they needed there. So they would make these elaborate um, little models of life for the pharaohs to take to the afterlife. And so this is the barge. It actually looks like a mummy on a barge, and it was found in a tomb. Now, through these relics, we know a lot about Egyptian daily life because that was depicted in these little sculptures that they would take into the tombs. Now here we have the art of weaving of uh, Persian rugs, uh, you know, a Persian carpet. And actually, this is a beautiful photograph of weavers, but you can also see that they're small children. And a lot of times, um, especially oh, before, like, say, the mid-20th century, the carpets were woven by young children, and they would lose their eyesight at a pretty young age. So here we have the art of everyday life of the carpets and then we have the everyday life of the carpets being made. Now another artist that's featured in your work I'm sorry another artist that's featured in your book uh, a different a different work is the artist Edward Hopper and he was a master at depicting scenes from everyday life and yet they all have a sort of a melancholy feel to them. The one in the book is just gas pumps but when you look at it, you can almost feel the cold wind blowing across the plain. And that was just, um, I guess you could say that was Edward Hopper's style, the way that he depicted his work. Let's look a little bit at Robert Rauschenberg. He was an important artist of the 20th century, one of the pioneers, really, of modern art. And he used a lot of different techniques. He was big uh, with what's called encaustic, painting with hot wax. Um, this particular piece is part of a series that he did uh, expressing his uh, feelings about us being so bombarded by images in our daily life. 
where we had so many images, we continue to have so many images around us that we really can't uh, process them all. So he would put all these images in one painting to kind of express his feelings about that. So now let's talk about art and the inner life. You know, most art in some way or another, or I should say much art, does express the inner life of the artist. I mean, that's just the nature of it, right? Art comes through the individual and is expressed in their own unique fashion. And uh, I think that's part of the beauty of art because it touches part of the more hidden side of life. And often people relate to that in a way that is deep and is really kind of difficult to explain. And yet uh, people can be touched very deeply by a work of art. So as we're talking about the inner life, I'm going to ask you to please read that section in the book for sure, pages 65 and 66 about the artist Frida Kahlo and the artist Meta Warwick Fuller. The Talking Skull, figure 316, is a very interesting story. We're going to look here. This is Rene Magritte, and he's a famous surrealist artist. And as many of these artists and works of art do, it, he kind of bridges a category. He's in that realm of looking deeply to the interior, to the hidden unconscious world, and he also could be probably considered a fantasy artist as well. Surrealism simply means super realism, but it also touched on the unconscious mind. The surrealists were active when Sigmund Freud was kind of the, the flavor of the month or the flavor of the years, when everyone was getting psychoanalysis and the realm of the unconscious is being explored as an important new realm. So Rene Magritte, he was one of the surrealists, and this is just um, a story, I mean a, a self-portrait that he painted showing himself, um, you could say, at his repast. Now let's look at one more. This is Vermeer, and he was also featured in your book. Vermeer is a very interesting artist. This is a different piece than the one you'll see in the book, but they both reflect this inner life of the sitter, or you may not know what's in the letter that she's reading, but you can tell that she's very, um, she's really contemplating whatever it is that she's reading. There's an interesting touch with this piece of the curtains that we see, the green curtains, that, are, that could just cover her, that could just close this figure out of our view and give her, make her be in a private space. You know, Vermeer was working, um, he did almost all of his work in one room of his house. We talked about this last week. He's a fascinating artist, and when we look at much of his work, we really do see some of the inner life of those people that he's depicting. So now we have Invention and Fantasy. This particular piece was by a guy called Harmonius Bosch, and during the Renaissance, he was all the rage, but his work was collected quietly because some of it verged on... Um, well, offensive or obscene, and he was a, he had a strong religious belief, sort of a Calvinistic religious association, but we really don't know that much about him. But he did some really weird stuff. Um, as you can see here, there's one example, and if you look closely, you can go, you just kind of want to say, okay, there's the egg with the snakes, and there's the donkey on the pig. Sure, you know, his stuff is so out there. And yet, you know, here it is. It has a life of its own. He's been painting since the 50, he painted in the 1500s, and his work is still widely known. He's a master. So here we have, this is another surrealist, Salvador Dali, and it's called The Persistence of Memory. This is a fantasy um, by Salvador Dali and is a very famous piece that maybe many of you have seen. So I've seen it in person at the Metropolitan Museum in, in uh, New York, and it's a pretty small piece, maybe 12 by 18, 12 by 16, something like that. So let's move on to, so this is Second Life. This is a Second Life birthday party image, and this is a, a game, a computer game, where people would create avatars or fantasies of themselves. So now let's talk a little bit about the natural world. 
This piece is by a friend of mine named William McNamara. He's a very well-known artist in uh, this region, and he paints the, the Buffalo River, the um, Ozark National Forest. This is a watercolor, and it's a large painting. Um, it's pretty miraculous that he gets these, I would say miraculous, but it's takes a lot of work for him to get these accurate photographic representations in watercolor. It's quite the feat. So now we're going to go on to the Hudson River School. I believe this one is in your book. It's a very famous painting. These painters in the Hudson River School, they worked during the 1800s and they helped to um, depict the landscape of this new unfolding uh, land that was America so others could appreciate it that couldn't travel and see the land. And they often idealized the landscapes a little bit, but they left us these large-scale dramatic paintings such as this one. And here we have a Chinese brush painting. And in this, the artists really were more focused on atmosphere, on giving you a sense of the place. Than, as then on an accurate depiction of a place. This is Spiral Jetty and it's um, also depicted in your book and it's from uh, a style of work that's called earthworks and that's basically where you you make something with uh, stone or earth that you're not going to sell, it's not marketable, it's simply art for art's sake. Now this is in the Great Salt Lake and if you drive down the interstate you can see it. At least the last time I was there it was still in place. And to do this, I don't know the statistics, I can't remember, but there's like tons and tons of rock and dirt had to be moved to create this. If you see that road, it's like a road that's big enough for two cars to pass. So this is a pretty large uh, earthwork that's just made in the middle of the Great Salt Lake. Oh, and it's designed to, uh, to decompose, to fall apart, to eventually go back into the lake. So now let's look at art for art's sake. It's our final section. And art for art's sake just means because it's so darn fun to do it or because it's there. This is a wrapped fountain by the artist Jean-Claude uh, and Christo. It was a, a couple, and Jean-Claude has died. But they were the people that would, uh, let's see, they wrapped an island in fabric. They wrapped this fountain in fabric. They did a beautiful work in New York City called the, par the Gates of Central Park. And they made these orange gates throughout the park. There's, I think we're going to see a video about this a little bit later in the semester. But, you know, one thing to remember about Jean-Claude and Christo is that they, they had these ideas about just creating art so that we see a space and experience a space differently. And again, they're not going to sell these gates. What they do is they actually sell photographs and little, I have a little piece of some of this fabric that someone gave me. So that's how they make a living and they get grants to these incredibly wild pieces like that. I mean... What are you thinking? But that's art for art's sake. Here's the artist Jackson Pollock and he was a really fascinating artist. Um, he did what he called action painting. Here's a finished one, right? A lot of you have heard of him. He's a dude that threw house paint at canvases. Now the reason that he was so uh, such a master of his time was because nobody had ever done it before. And in what he called action painting you would be purchasing the moment, the scene, the, his experience of doing art for its own sake on these large-scale canvases. So here he is creating one of his paintings and this is really how they came about. Now um, he died actually after he sold a painting for the very most he'd ever sold a painting for, five thousand dollars. And he was driving in a convertible uh, with a lady and they crashed and he was killed. So his work is now in, you know, all the much more valuable since he's no longer with us. But we get to see this moment in time captured forever for an artist that's gone, really, with his work. All right, so this completes our discussion of chapter three. I do strongly suggest that you go back through and, and look at the high points in the chapter and look at the images. And I just want to thank you all so much for listening. Bye for now.